morning, Delta College. I am so excited to be here and to be standing in unity with Jan and with Lynn as we are so excited because our Women's History Month Committee has been working really hard um, and we brainstormed different ideas. Obviously, we know we're at this point celebrating 100 years of suffrage of women with the right to vote. But how do we talk about that in a way that really can um, involve a lot more of us that, that maybe doesn't if we only think of it in the context of voting. And that's where we talked about the idea of voice, right? The idea of every individual has a voice. And if we have a voice and we feel empowered, then maybe we can do something that affects some change. And earlier this morning, a Good Day Sacramento, uh, from, from Sacramento obviously, was here doing live shots to promote our event. And I heard Carmen say something that really struck me. She said, when I started, I didn't start this um, with someone with the name of Carmen Perez Jordan, you know, national leader. It was really, I'm someone in my community doing something small, affecting the things that I can change. And that is how she was able to build um, a network and build a coalition and, and, and keep going until she was able to do more. And I think that's really what today is about. So we're here to hear Carmen's story, but then also we hope that we hear our own story here so that we can continue to affect powerful change here at, on the campus of San Joaquin Delta College, as we have done and, and hope to continue that, and throughout our community. So it's with that that I am so honored to introduce Carmen Perez. I'm going to show a video, and then Carmen will come out afterwards. So let me... Let me do this, uh, but we're so excited and so honored to have so many of you here today, recognizing that um, maybe our group isn't as big as we would have liked, but, uh, but that's okay, right? Coronavirus is something that some folks are, are, are afraid of, but let me take this moment to put a PSA that uh, San Joaquin Delta College is a safe place. We're uh, using common sense, washing our hands, and... Uh, breaking down uh, stigmas and barriers all the way around. Okay. It's not easy to organize a march at this caliber with such little time because it's all happening simultaneously. What else is next on the agenda? Convener table, define roles, artist table, have you secured parking for your buses? Not yet. So, we're great with indigenous rights. We're good with criminal justice. Immigrant rights, we could be a little bit stronger. Who do we need on that? Women of color felt as though they were being erased from the narrative because white women initially were organizing this. My role is to ensure that there's inclusivity. We're working on a convener's table to ensure authenticity and inclusivity of the march. Those that were most impacted by this election's rhetoric have to be a part of this. The reason why I fight for young women is because my sister's death allowed me to see my purpose in life. She died so young. She was about to be 19 years old before she was killed. She was buried on my birthday, January 21st. It's also the day of the Women's March. After I lost my sister, <clears throat> I could have really gotten lost in my grief and sadness. Her life gave me a sense of what I needed to do. I always saw my sister in a lot of these girls, so I marched for her. Join our movement. We got to come together as a people, collectively. This march is not against any one person in particular. This march is for something. This is an attack on the systemic racism, on misogyny, on sexism. Women have been organizing to come together to Washington, D.C. on January 21st. It's in the spirit of all the work that you guys did over 50 years ago in the original March on Washington. We have to come together in solidarity and in unity and create the beloved community that Dr. King talked about as women, as gender nonconforming individuals, as trans women, and also with our brothers who stand by our side. Thank you for organizing this march. Is there anything immediately that I can do to help or? If you could tweet right now, I am happy to support Women's March on January 21st. Please join me. That will be happening in the next few minutes. Yay! <laughs> 
this is an intergenerational march because we need to show our daughters that we are also leaders. And in 20 years, we're going to be looking back, being grateful for the opportunity, but also knowing that we've passed the baton to the next generation. There are women across the country depending on... difficulties, but nevertheless, she persisted, okay? So we're going to keep going. Um, we are so honored to welcome to the stage and to San Joaquin Delta College, Carmen Perez. Please, let's show her a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good. Does anybody know that song? Yes. <laughs> um, I just, first of all, I want to say thank you to the Women's History Month Committee here at Delta College, um, Adriana, Brittany, Lynn, Jan, um, for inviting me to come here back to Stockton. I was here about two months ago. And also, um, I kind of feel, you know, I grew up in a small town outside of Los Angeles. Um, called Oxnard, California. And uh, thank you. Many people don't know where that's at. And so I always feel connected to Stockton because it reminds me a lot of my childhood hometown and also the fact that my husband is from Stockton and so is his family, the Jordan family, who's also here with us. Um, but, you know, I, I'm kind of bummed that that had some technical difficulties, but there's always opportunity in chaos. Um, so I wanted to just um, begin by thanking all of you who came out. I know that the coronavirus is something that people are a little afraid of, but I also want to remind you that it's cold outside and we have to bundle up. If not, we're going to get what my, my husband calls the Heineken virus. Um, so just be careful, all right? Be careful when you're out there. But it's truly an honor to be here. Um, I flew in from New York City celebrating the 93rd birthday of my mentor, Harry Belafonte, who dedicated his life to the civil rights movement. He walked along Dr. King as well as was part of the original March on Washington. Um, but I want to share with you a little bit about my life story. And I know that we're talking today about advocacy and activism. And like Adriana said, I wasn't always an activist. Um, I found myself at a very young age experiencing a lot of the trauma that many of our communities experience. I grew up uh, the child of a father who was a Chicano born in Anaheim, California in 1924. He had me in his 50s and I was his oh sh his blessing baby. <laughs> and my mother uh, was a woman from Mexico. She was 20 years younger than my father and came with a very different upbringing and different cultural experiences and had a very different understanding of what America was. She didn't come here for a as an economic refugee, she came here because my father and my uncle Damasio went to Mexico to party during some April event in her hometown. And he danced with my mother, sat her down, danced with all these other women, and came back a week later and asked for her hand in marriage. He knew she was the one. And they had been together for about 55 years until he passed away last year. But I say that because I grew up... Um, with two cultural differences happening in, in my home, as well as um, I grew up with a loving uh, foundation of church, as well as I grew up uh, with domestic violence and alcoholism. And that's really what led me to the streets. I grew up playing basketball, softball, I ran track, I danced hip hop, and my community was plagued with police surveillance, gangs, all these different things that kind of are happening 24 hours that really take um, you from what your parents want you to become. And so luckily I had a positive coach by the name of Pat Bell who coached me in all those different sports. I played travel basketball and created a positive outlet that really interrupted the trauma brain that was developing as I was trying to protect myself from the, 
the things that were happening at home. And so I remember finding myself in eighth grade um, wanting to be a peer helper, and I became the peer helper president. And one of the responsibilities was to bring people together, to have conversations about what was happening in our community. And I remember one time jumping on a girl's back because she was a bully. And I don't, I really don't condone violence. Like, I practice King Yin on violence. I don't know if you saw that in the, the video, but I remember wanting to advocate for a young boy who was being called names, and I thought that I could stick up for this girl who was a lot bigger than me. Um, and I had said to her, you need to pick on somebody your own size. Clearly, we were not the same size. But I feel that was the first time that I really was able to stick up for someone. Um, and I felt that that was the beginning of my advocacy. A couple years later, I find myself um, watching my parents really suffer when my sister was killed. My sister and I were a day and two years apart, and she was buried on my 17th birthday. She would have been 19. And we, every year, we celebrated our birthdays together. We shared a room. We shared secrets. She wore pink. I wore blue. She was a cheerleader. I was a basketball player. But one thing that was so true and evident was the fact that we were sisters. And when I lost her, I really saw part of my life ending. I didn't know how to move throughout life without her. I didn't know how to move throughout life without my protector. And I remember watching my father for the first time cry. I don't know about you all, but it's not often that I see the men in my life cry. And it was, um, there had been a knock on the door and it was, police officers in the district attorney that asked my father, are you gonna be pressing charges against the person that took your daughter's life? And he had said and turned to my mother, he said, I can't take another mother's child away. And I remember that doing, so I'm 17 years old. Could you imagine that? Anybody here 17 years old? No, it's okay. Sometimes we pretend we could be 17. But I was 17 years old and I was angry. How dare you make a decision about not taking a mother's child and not have him pay consequences when he's ruined my life? At 17, everything was about Carmen Perez. It was about taking me to school. It was about making sure I had my Aquanet hairspray in the restroom. It was about making sure that I had my jersey laid out for me and washed. Everything was about me. I didn't really understand this um, idea of somebody having compassion, but in reality, that was the first time that I learned about forgiveness, compassion. Forgiveness was not for the other family. It was for my father and for us. And also, it was the first time I had been exposed to restorative justice. We often talk about restorative justice and repairing the harm done in criminal justice uh, spaces, but in reality, it was the first time that I had witnessed it. And although it took me a little longer to digest and understand, it was the foundation of who I would then become. And so luckily, I was smart and I played ball that I was able to navigate and change my life and go to college. I went to UC Santa Cruz. I'm a banana slug, college eight. <laughs> I studied psychology, and that really was the first time that I was introduced to Chicana feminism. And I learned it from a woman named Aida Hurtado, and I say all that because when I was in her class, I think Aida, who is a Mexican-American woman, had a very similar upbringing to myself. She had her, her siblings who were in and out the system like myself. I remember looking at her and seeing myself in her. I was like, damn, that's me. That's going to be me one day. But Aida, in return, thought that I was just this loud student who constantly challenged her, who wasn't paying attention half the time because I was working three jobs in the front row falling asleep. But what she didn't understand is that I did pay attention to her, that I wanted to be her. And one of the things that she had taught me is that she taught me about intersectional feminism. She taught me about black radical feminism that happened in the 1940s, as well as intersectional feminism that Kimberly Crenshaw coined in the 1980s. 
And what I didn't realize is that I was beginning to have an identity because in, in my childhood years, my identity was basketball and hip hop. That's who I was. If you asked me, if you saw me on the street, you would see me with Spalding. My date for prom was Spalding. Me and my basketball rolled everywhere, and I did not hesitate to try to compete with you on the court. But you see, when I went to college, I didn't see other Chicanas playing ball. I didn't see other people who grew up in communities that were diverse like myself. My, my coaches, my teachers, my pastors were black. My friends were Samoan, Korean. We, we were a conglomerate of people playing ball, all because we wanted to survive and we wanted to get out of our house. So when I went to UC Santa Cruz and I studied about all these different types of people, particularly women who had paved the way for myself, I was in awe. But I didn't realize that feminism was actually founded in the late, or no, I think it was 1837 by a philosopher who was from France by the name of Charles. All this time, I thought feminism was founded by women. And so then I say to myself, hmm, how many of you knew that? That feminism was founded by a French philosopher by the name of Charles about two of you, maybe three. I think somebody back there raised their hand or maybe they're fixing the wires. <laughs> All that to say is that as I was learning to find my identity on campus, oftentimes you feel lost. Unless you go to a junior college or you go to a community college, sometimes you feel disconnected. And so I felt disconnected until I found Aida and I learned about all these different women who've paved the way for me. And so as we sit here and we talk about celebrating 100 years of the suffragist movement and the right to vote, we received the right to vote in the 1920s, right? We talk about 100 years of celebration. We didn't really have that implemented until 20 years later. And if you look at the suffragist parade of, the 19, of 1912, you realize that black women, Latina women, Asian women, Pacific Islander women were not at the forefront. They were not even included. And so feminism has, always, has not always included women of color. And so therefore, in the 1940s, when black radical feminists came, they made sure that they created entry points for people like myself to get involved. That allowed Chicana feminism to actually be part of the conversation of the 1980s. So we go into these different waves of feminism, whether it's the first wave, the second wave, the third wave. They say that we're now at the fourth wave of feminism, which was founded in the 19, 1992, that allowed for the conversation of, of us to bring exposure through social media of violence against women, now called the Me Too campaign. But I would say that we are in a different phase, which is the fifth wave of feminism. And what that is for Carmen Perez Jordan, it is inclusive, it is intersectional, and it understands the complexities of humanity. And so when I was leading the Women's March, it wasn't because I was woke. I'm still learning. I'm still learning about indigenous rights. I'm still learning about trans rights. I'm still engaging in courageous conversations. I don't know everything. But I believe that there is a lane for all of us, that there is a lane for you, there's a lane for you, there's a lane for you up there, and there's a lane for you. Because in order for us to build a movement, all of us need to bring our power together. The Women's March, look, let me tell you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep it 100. I've been in this field for 25 years, from creating alternatives to incarceration in Santa Cruz County, being a youth advocate, working in high schools, being a probation officer, doing system accountability from within, reducing racial disparities and gender responsive programming, then going from Santa Cruz to New York City 
to build a national movement to end child incarceration for Harry Belafonte. After 20 years of my sister being gone, I finally had come home to Oxnard to deal with the pain that I had ran away from and to organize in my own community and talk about juvenile justice reform and how do we close down youth prisons. So at the time in 2016, I had been in my childhood hometown organizing, meeting people who I hadn't seen in 20 years telling me, hey, mija, oh my God, it's so good to see you. I've been out for 10 years. And it was painful because as I was going to talk to the community about this work, the community wasn't ready to close down youth prisons or to create alternatives to incarceration or to talk about leadership development in our young people. We weren't ready. Oxnard, California wasn't ready. And so oftentimes there was major disappointment when I had meetings or people were bringing up my sister because they hadn't talked about her or hadn't seen me in 20 years. And so they were sharing with me how much they missed her, how much she meant to them. And I sometimes wasn't ready to receive it all because it brought up things for me that I hadn't dealt with. Or the fact that some of my family members had been killed to gun violence, gang violence, or whatever type of violence. So I was going home, and so as I was in Oxnard and I finally completed our three-day juvenile justice conference, I was like, I'm gonna go back to New York City. It's gonna be November, December. I'm gonna do some strategic planning with my, my um, organization, and I'm gonna actually uh, get some sleep, right? Some of us just want to sleep. We're tired, my body's weary. And so that's what I thought what was happening. And then the election happened. And I remember going to Washington, D.C. to talk about the election. I thought we had it in the bag. And we get back on a train, myself, a woman named Tamika Mallory, and one of my rapper, artivist brothers, by the name of my son, we got back on a train and what was happening is that there were spots where we weren't getting reception. So we were hearing that Trump was up, that Hillary, like it was just back and forth. And I remember that Trump had ran his campaign off of racism. He had said that Mexicans were rapists. And I remember being really hurt and as you can see, oftentimes I show up for other ethnic groups. I show up for Black Lives Matter. I show up for Muslim rights. I show up for all these different groups. And I remember my friends being silent. And I was angry because of what he said he was going to do to our community. And so at the time, my mother gives me a call because the election had happened. And my mother gives me a call, and she's like, you need to stop worrying the world on your shoulders. Because what I had felt is I had felt the same weight on my shoulders than when my sister had passed away. It was like this cloud that was over me. And I finally realized that I wasn't gonna sit back. I got a call within, how many of you all heard of the Million Women's March? Anybody? So there was a woman by the name of Teresa Shook who had posted on social media that she was going to march with all her friends to Washington, Washington D.C., and it was called the Million Women's March. And black Twitter tore them up. Do you all remember that? Because there was a black Million Women's March that happened 20 years prior in Philadelphia. And so what women were saying, black women in particular, were saying this is an erasure. Again, this is white feminism showing up, erasing the work that has happened in the past. So there were these women who wanted to fix it. And they had contacted somebody that I know by the name of Michael Skolnick, and he's like, I know the women who know how to organize in their sleep. And so we received a call. On the other end, there was two other women. We, Tamika and I, myself ended up deciding to meet with them, and we ended up inviting Bernice King to a conversation, that is Dr. King's daughter, to give us the blessing so that we could rename the march to the Women's March on Washington. And she had said something so profound to us. 
she had said that her mother, Coretta Scott King, that this was a time for women to rise. And she was honored that we would call her. And she said that her mother had said, women, if the soul of the nation is to be saved, you must become its soul. And so at the time when I felt like all I wanted to do was sleep, I didn't need another title, I'm trying to raise money for my organization, I'm trying to heal from going back home a little bit, I felt this huge responsibility, not to myself, but to you women. I felt that all the years that I had been organizing from being a basketball coach to a probation officer to organizing across the country, Little Rock, Arkansas, meeting the Little Rock Nine, Columbus, Ohio, Philadelphia, all these different places had prepared me to be one of the national coaches in the Women's March on Washington because the women were trying to make it against something. When you're against something, what are you actually creating? What door are you opening but just shutting a door? It's about creating opportunities, creating entry points. And not everybody was a seasoned organizer, let me just tell you that. But you don't need seasoned organizers to organize the largest single day protest in the history of America. What you need is heart. Because you could teach somebody how to organize. You could teach somebody about an issue. You can't teach anybody how to have heart and to show up every single day to have compassion and forgiveness. And so we showed up. Every single day, I opened my doors to my office. My office should really only occupy about 12 people, but we had 70 people rolling in and out of that office every single day for eight weeks committed to keep their eyes on the prize. And what was the prize? January 21st, 2017, the Women's March on Washington. And it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. I had to run a campaign to free, to, to raise the age of 16 and 17 year olds, to be removed from Rikers in New York. I missed the holidays with my family in California because I stayed back and it was actually one of the last holidays that my father spent with us. But I made a commitment because what I knew I was bringing to the table was greater, a greater vision that I had been invested in by so many others. Being at the at the, at the feet of a Harry Belafonte telling me of the conversations he had with Dr. King and Eleanor Roosevelt and Diane Nash and Representative Jonathan Lewis and Bernard Lafayette allowed me to remind people that this wasn't about Trump. And when I began to invite people to be partners of the march, they were like, oh, we don't want to mess with this. We don't want to go up against Trump. But it wasn't about Trump because how many of us have been living in the conditions in our community for so long? Trump was just a symptom. So we had to remind people that this was bigger than themselves, that this wasn't about your ego or the lack of expertise. The people that we were organizing with were yoga instructors, were communication directors, they were chefs, had never been activists. But you know what they did is they gave every moment of their waking days to this movement. And so we organized the largest single day protest with 5.2 million people, with 70 national organizers, 400 state coordinators, 90 global leaders. We have about 70 people in this room, right? Imagine if you all dedicated eight weeks to something that you all committed yourself to. Imagine the change that would happen in your community. If you said today, Stockton is gonna be a place without violence, our children are gonna thrive and we're gonna work on that, imagine what can happen. And it wasn't about who was in the front page of the magazine. It wasn't about who got the, 
the, the, the, the ability to talk to the news. It wasn't about that. It was actually about the fact that you all were organizing together, bringing all your different talents together to make sure that Stockton was a place where children could thrive. That's what we did for eight weeks. But like I said, it wasn't easy because we became, because we were the four national coaches and I was a face of the Women's March, I became a target. And what you all didn't see here is actually the work that I've been doing in prisons. I've been organizing in Tracy, cultural and spiritual ceremonies since I was 20 years old. I was going into the Bronx Detention Center to work with young people that were incarcerated. I've traveled to the prisons of El Salvador to support a peace process between MS-13 and 18th Street gangs. I remember when I used to wake up and I'm like, I'm gonna die for the movement. I am here to die for the movement. And you know what? I have a son now who's a year old. I was like, wait a second. Could we send somebody else? <laughs> I'm joking. I'm still showing up. I'm still showing up. And I'm bringing my son. But all that to say is the fact that, you know, I share with you my father's story because it really takes somebody's heart to show you something different. It really takes a person who you love, who you've never seen in that position to show you something different. And it's really about what you do with that. There's a piece in that video that says, I could have really died in my grief. Believe me, I wanted to sleep in my bed and put the covers over me and wish that the days went away. But my mother would take the darn covers off, and she used to be like, get up. You have life. You got to go out and do something with it. It's not about living just for yourself. It's about living for your sister. And so that's what I've done for 25 years. I've taken tragedy. I've taken the gifts the pain that I have had in my life, and I've transformed them into gifts to share with you. And when I say that all those years that I organized in the prisons or I organized in community and I had to sleep on benches and I had to sleep on floors prepared me for the moment in which I would be attacked and I would be told I'm not good enough and I would be told that I shouldn't be a leader. It prepared me to have courageous conversations around race because no one was trying to have those. It prepared me to lead the Women's March and to have compassion for the people who didn't understand. It wasn't about me telling people, oh my God, when you say things like that, you're being racist. It wasn't about shutting people out or calling them out. It was about leaning in with love and calling them in. You see, we live in this call-out culture where we just shut people out of our lives and we say, you know what, that's a Trump supporter or that's a Republican or that person has red hair or that person has crazy teeth and we, and, or their shoes are just not as cool as mine. So you know what, I'm going to shut you out. That's not the way in which I organize. What we do is we meet people where they're at and we champion them to our cause. And so I'm not telling you, like, this is what you need to do in order to be a great organizer. These are the little things that I've learned along the way that I feel work, that allow me to build with other people who don't have the same interest as me, who don't have the same upbringing as me. But all that to say that it's the small acts of kindness, it's the small things that you do in your community, and it's also when you show up to the voting poll. We talk about women not having the right to vote. At some point, people of color, particularly black people, were only worth three-fifths of a vote. There have people who have been water hose showing up to vote, who have had to pay money to vote, and we have the ability to vote. And for those of you who don't have the ability to vote because of your immigration status or because you're too young, Remember, there's other ways in which you could also show up. The work that I do at the Gathering for Justice, it is grounded in Kenyan nonviolence. 
One of the principles of nonviolence is attack the forces, not people do. Attack forces of evil, not people doing evil. And so again, when I told you it wasn't about Trump, it's because it was about the systems of oppression that we had to break down. And so one of the things that we have in our communities is voter suppression. And so we have to figure out how do we come together in order to knock down those systems of oppression. But you, all of you, if you just think about your life, if you think about what you've done, you already know that you're an activist. How many of you have ever organized a birthday party? Raise your hand. You an organizer. <laughs> How many of you have ever organized trying to get people out the house? You're an organizer. How many of you have organized a group at a church or a community or something like that? You're an organizer. So just because we have different ways or different events that we've organized, that doesn't mean that you are not an organizer. You have the ability to change the conditions in your community. You have the ability to change something that's not working for you. I was um, getting ready earlier today, and I was thinking about, it's so funny because I write notes down, and then I forget to look at them the whole, the whole time that I'm talking. But I was thinking about, um, you know, waking up. And so, like I mentioned to you, the work that I do isn't easy, right? Oftentimes, you get judged, you get criticized, or you get put on social media, and you get a lot of death threats. And people ask me, what do you do to take care of yourself, and why do you actually continue to do this work, understanding that you're putting your family in, in harm's way? And I do it because every single day is a new opportunity for me. It's the way in which I show up. I want to sit there and believe me, I think Jay's sister and my husband's sisters have witnessed me being like, oh my God, I got accused of this. Life is over. It really isn't. And I'm not saying that, like, you, ha that you have to change your whole life. But every single day there's an opportunity to do something that you've always wanted to do or to change something that you've always wanted to change in your life. There's an opportunity to make that phone call that you've always dreaded, to travel to the place you've always wanted to go, to do the thing you've always wanted to do. There's a new opportunity. And what we end up doing as human beings is that we wait, we wait, we wait, we wait, because we think that we live forever. And as I learned at a very young age, life is not guaranteed tomorrow. And so when you think that you don't have the ability to do something, just remember, you do. And like Nike said, just do it. And so, I wanna leave you with a few things. How much more time do I have? I'm good. How many, of you, how many of you know Dolores Huerta, or have heard of Dolores Huerta? She's dope, huh? Yes. yes. So I don't know, so my husband and I, and he's actually in the room now with the Laker hat on. My husband and I have these debates about Stockton and Oxnard, right? And so one of the things that I tell my husband, I was like, yo, Cesar Chavez was in Oxnard, and he's like, well, Dolores Huerta was in, in Stockton, right? So we kind of go back and forth. We compete about our cities. And like, you know, I'm going to keep it 100, like I said, Stockton is growing on me. I love Stockton because it does remind me of my community. But one of the amazing women that came here to organize was Dolores Huerta, and she said something to me that really resonates, and I hope it resonates with you. She said, every moment is an organizing opportunity. Remember those of you who raised your hand, you all are organizers. Yes. Every person a potential activist every minute a chance to change the world. You have the opportunity to change the world, whether it's the world around you, whether it's the world on a global scale. Remember, you have to start somewhere. When I was 16 years old, I worked for a company called Hot, Hot Dog Salmon Corn Dog. 
Y'all ever seen that? The people that kind of like jump and make lemonade with the, yeah, that was me. I was making your lemonade with some crazy hat. I used to burn my hands because I used to get the pretzels from the oven. But I started there. And I began to feel connected to something, especially when my sister passed away. And so not that I'm saying you haven't been activated, but there's times that things happen in your life that activate you to get involved or to champion that cause. And what I say to people is don't wait for that to happen to you. You have the opportunity to do that right now. There's an election that's happening this year, and you have the opportunity to get all your friends, your homeboys, your homegirls, your cousins, your in-laws, all the people that you love, and take them to go vote. But also remember that it also starts within you. It starts with what you tell yourself. It starts with where you expose yourself to. It starts with you. And what I recommend to people is, like, take care of yourself. If you're tired of work, I'm not telling you don't show up to work because shit. God knows what would happen if I didn't show up. But if you're tired, take some time for yourself. And I'm actually really speaking for myself. I'm speaking to myself as I'm speaking to you. Because sometimes I have to say it out loud in order for me to remind myself that I got to take time, that I have to have to care for others. I remember back in the day when like old people were like around, my mother used to be like, go help them with their groceries. Now, now we don't even have that. I tell my husband and he's like, don't put gender in it. But I'm like, man, I remember when people used to open the doors for you. And he's like, aren't you a feminist? And I was like, yeah, but I still like my door open. <laughs> those are the small things. It's just those small things. I'm not talking about go organize a protest or go organize a march. Yes, you could do that too. And there's somebody here who I would love to connect you with who is part of my organization who lives in Stockton, Jasmine Dallafoss. Yes, you could do that and connect with her, but it's the small things. It's helping your grandma. It's giving your brother a hug. It's reminding our people that we are worthy. It's voting for something that's going to be benefit our, our community. It's actually just showing up. And so my last thing is there's a, uh, there are two other women who I love, and I'm not sure if you could see them on here, but um, in our police accountability work that we do in New York City um, and the Women's March, it kind of seems like we bring each other into every space that we're in. A woman by the name of Tamika Mallory, who used to work at the National Action Network, um, and a Muslim woman by the name of Linda Sarsour. And I remember when I saw Linda and I heard her speak, um, I was like, damn, that woman reminds me of Malcolm because she was just so raw with her words. And she's Palestinian. And I think sometimes we don't understand other cultures, so we make assumptions about other cultures. And one of the things that we're trained in in Kenyan on violence is to suspend your first judgment and gather more information. Imagine that. Imagine if you walked into a room and you weren't judging everybody that you saw, but you actually gathered more information and you actually were able to connect with people on a heart-to-heart -heart level. I remember I went to a rally in New York with her and she spoke and she had quoted an Aboriginal woman from Australia by the name of Leela Watson. And she said, if you have come here because your liberation is, if you have come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you have come here because your liberation is bound with mine, let us work with one another. And so I say to you, for all of you to look around this room, look around the room, look at each other. This is your community. This is Stockton. This is Delta College. This is your community. And you don't know who's sitting here needing support. And you don't know who's sitting here who has resources. 
But one thing we should always do is connect with one another. Yeah, I know you came to listen to me. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. But I really hope that you all could connect with one another. Because it's going to be you. Superman isn't coming. Wonder Woman isn't coming. I don't know what other superhero is out there, but those are the two that I remember. <laughs> we are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the ones that are going to make change. We are the experts of our own community, of our own families, of what we need to do in order to change the conditions. And so I want to welcome you to do that work. I want to remind you of all the beautiful women that have come and paved the way from our mothers, our grandmothers, our great-grandmothers, women like Diane Nash, Dolores Huerta, Aida Hurtado. And there's one last woman that I want to recognize. I went to UC Santa Cruz, and if you all know UC Santa Cruz, it's a pretty forward-thinking college where there's a lot of activism, and one of the professors there was a woman by the name of Angela Davis, who was part of the Black Panther Party. And she often talked about another significant woman in her life. And so I'm going to ask you to get up. And in honor of just celebrating International Women's History, and we're in the middle of celebrating Women's History Month, I just want to remind you that women should be celebrated every single day. Every single day. And although they give us a month, I'm going to take it. <laughs> I'm going to take it. We're gonna, you know how like you get one day, you're, it's like your birthday, and you're like, it's my birthday month. <laughs> well, we should be saying it's our woman year. And it really is. We've made many contributions. Women have constantly showed up and so many movements. We have been the backbones of movement. When you think about Dr. Martin Luther King, you also have to recognize the women that held him up. When you think about Cesar Chavez, you have to think about the women like Dolores Huerta and so many others that held him up. When you think about Corky Gonzalez and the Chicano movement or the American Indian movement, there was consistently women that were doing the work. And so nothing has changed. The only thing that has changed is that we've become more visible. But with that is that we also need to protect one another. And so there's a woman by the name of Asada Shakur, and this is her chant. So if you could just hold hands and get close. Come on. I know, wait. OK. I also know there's like this virus because we're in an election year. <laughs> And I just want to remind you every year, so you could hold elbows, whatever you want to do. But I want you to get closer. I want you to get closer. And remember, you are the change agents. You are the ones we've been waiting for. It does, and you know what? Access. We talk about our youth, our, our future. Our young people are really you are our present, and you are the greatest gift that we have. But there are elders here who have lived life. Access them. Make them your mentors, your femtors. Remember, knowledge is power. They don't want you to know about the past. And the people who sit in this room who are a little bit older than you or a lot older than you, they got wisdom. I sit at the feet of Harry Belafonte, and I get to hear about the tactics in the past. I just add my own flavor. And so I want to remind you of that, but I also want to remind you that we got each other. So you're going to repeat after me. All right, we're going to start low. So save your breath, save your energy. All right. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Remember, chains don't have to be physical. Chains could be in your mind. You create your own chains. You create what stops you. No one has as much power over you than you have over yourself. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to win. 
We must love and protect one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. All right, you got to bring it. You got to bring this one. This one is for your future children, for your future grandchildren, the next seven generations. If we didn't just think about the now and really thought about the next seven generations, we would be in a better place. All right? And remember, this is about you. This is about the contributions. Your life has not been written. Well, they say that in the Bible it's already been written before you. But what I'm saying to you is that at this moment you have the ability to do something meaningful and purposeful with your life. It's up to you. All right. We're going to say it very loud because this is for the next several generations. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect one another. We must love and protect one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Thank you. Thank you so much. If any of you have any questions for Ms. Perez, uh, we'd love to hear them. She'd love to answer them. Are you, you're just pumped up. You want to go out and go change things, aren't you? <laughs> Uh, does anybody have any questions? You can, yeah, okay. You ever get imposter syndrome? Uh, I work too hard to even get any type of feelings like that. And it's because, like, my work is not a nine to five. My work is every single day because there's crisis happening every single day. And so there are moments when you're on the phone with mothers who have had sons killed at the hands of police, or you have had uh, family members um, that have lost somebody to incarceration. There's always loss, there's always crisis. And your responsibility is not to focus on the negative, but try to focus on the solution. And so, you know, that's a great question. I think I should really think about that, but hadn't thought about that before. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Um, we do want to let you know that uh, Carmen, Carmen has graciously allowed San Joaquin Delta College to record today. And I think that for those of us who are here who have been so inspired by her, um, we are looking forward to sharing this with the rest of our community and colleagues. So if you would like to look for this later, you can find this on uh, Delta College Radio and Television's YouTube. And you can find us at DCTV On Demand. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you.